Praise from Gertie is very high praise. <laughs> I'm going to start off with a little video just because. which is an excellent way to make sure that they do it well. But what about the rest of us? 
if you're not a small developer, you have no ambition of becoming a small developer, or maybe you're a renter like me, what can you do? <laughs> so this was a question that I set out to explore uh, when I went to grad school. As, as Anne mentioned, I did a degree um, in England, and it was called Planning, Growth, and Regeneration. And the purpose of that was to study how can we help places that are stagnant or in decline? What kind of policies and programs can we use to help these places? If you're familiar with England, you'll know that the north of England has always been a little bit um, more depressed economically than the southeast. And so we studied that, and what I found is, even though England is kind of you know, light years ahead in terms of their thinking on urban planning and that sort of thing, it really came down to the people that were in each city they were trying to help. The same programs didn't work just as well in every place. It depends who's implementing it. And that made me think, okay, well, it really is about the capacity that we can build on the ground to do these good things, because a good idea only goes so far. And I wanted to study that firsthand, and so I ended up moving back to Canada. I moved to Fredericton Brownwood, which is the location of the star here. It's not a glamorous place. If I were an, an audience of Canadians, probably 60% of them wouldn't know where Fredericton New Brunswick is. And it, it's extremely charming and lovable. I have been there because my, my husband is from the area. But we decided to move back because you know he loved that place. And I thought, well, this is as good as any to try and study how people can actually impact somewhere. If it's small enough to make a difference, um, it's small enough to study how you make a difference. So what have I learned there? Will wanted me to show this video as well. When I came here a year ago, I made this video that people really liked. It was about the reasons I moved to Fredericton. I talked about being in love with a special guy. I talked about the charming downtown, the social events, and the lower cost of living. So that's why I came. A year later, the reason I've decided to stay a while is all the people who are quietly just killing it in little old Fredericton. It's cliche, I know, I love this place because of the people, but really, it's people, neighbors, champions, advocates, that make all the magic happen. At one point, they decided to stay, just like me, because their work matters here and makes a difference. And they inspire others to make a difference too. To show my appreciation to some people who have really inspired me, I decided to make some public thank yous. A team of friends and family joined me to pin a ribbon on 15 favorite things around town that are super chill about it, but are definitely killing it. Nice job, everybody. That's just a small list of some of my favorite things outside the front door. Many of them have become such a central part of life here that we forget that they were not always available, or that maybe they had to dodge red tape to exist in the first place. Fixtures of life, like Picaroons and the Walking Bridge, were once just an idea. It took inspired and persistent people to see a vision and make it happen. By meeting people, I've learned that the Fredericton I love did not come prepackaged or designed by government policy. It was built slowly by good neighbors going a little above and beyond because it's worth it. That's such a comforting thought because you can't take that kind of power away. The power of people actually caring and doing something about it. It's not something that depends on a provincial budget or the party in office. And it's not something that you grow out of either. In fact, as Maritimers get older, we'll be lucky to have more folks with extra time, extra wisdom, and skills to be killing it all day in the community. 
I've been made very aware of the challenges we face in New Brunswick. But living here for a year has shown me how many people are rising to those challenges, one neighborly act at a time. And we all can too. We just have to want to. I do want to. And in shorthand, I've been calling that mission Front Doors. Here's what I mean. So before moving here, every advertisement told me of the wonders right outside my back door in New Brunswick. You know, the rivers, the ocean, the forests. The world outside our back doors here is phenomenal. I brag about it too. But I think we under-recognize the wonders outside our front doors in every small town main street or city centre. It's the public squares, parks, patios, sidewalks, festivals and local businesses that make a place nice for everyday living, working, socialising and growing older. It's our front doors that will make people want to stay and build businesses here. And it's life outside the front door that makes you want to give back. So here's how I want to give back. With the help of some friends, I'm putting together something called Front Doors. For now, it's a website to celebrate and cultivate more of that good stuff. But if you like what we're doing, it can be more. It could be a place to organize neighbors, fundraise for community-led projects, and issue much-deserved thank yous. But for now, we'd love to hear from you. Who's a good neighbor that makes a difference outside your front door? Tweet it to Front Doors NB. Oh, and by the way, if you want a guided tour of the 15 chalk ribbons around town, you can download a map at frontdoorsnb.com or pick up a copy at the Pickaroons Boutique. So that was something that I did a couple of years ago, and I'm still being recognized on the street as, you know, oh, the chalk lady. <laughs> When I said that it was a team of friends and family that helped me do it, my 60-year-old uh, parents were visiting on vacation, and I wanted to make sure they had a vacation they would never forget. <laughs> so <laughs> we took their rental car, and I made sure that we uh, were able to, you know, at least once in our life, go out in the middle of the night with stencils and uh, <laughs> do something that looked very close to vandalism together. <laughs> That's a, that was a very good memory for us. But the point of that is, it's home buddies. It's these people that um, do small things that really make a place feel loved. It makes it feel lived in, and it makes it feel worth being in. And what I want to talk about today is why it needs to be you. Because even if we're all of this mindset that small is beautiful, we can take small steps and uh, to get to this larger whole. If those small steps are not coming from the bottom up, it has a very different feel to it. Um, the, the government or an economic development agency can take those small steps and they can do a really good job, but it's just not going to be quite the same as if it's coming from the people. Um, and I don't mean for this to be a hokey inspirational speech because it's actually quite tactical. Um, it, needs, it needs to be you. And the first reason for that is an issue of authenticity. <coughs> So charm and hominess come from the ground up. And that's what we want in the city. You know, when you, when you go and visit a place and you take pictures and have postcards of it, it's because it's charming generally. It's not because it's, uh, I mean, if you tried to build it brand new as a replica, it wouldn't even be quite the same. Even in Paris, which is the, the quintessential example of a beautiful city, where does everybody like to go the most? It's the Latin Quarter. The Latin Quarter is the most ground up part of all of Paris. And so we have this innate attraction to that sort of thing. And when we're dealing with city building and how do we build better cities, we're often preoccupied with the projects rather than <coughs> the process to achieve those projects. So we see something like um, uh, pop-up shops or we'll see food trucks as the solution, when really it's, well, how did those come to be and who are the people that film, are, are filling them? And we don't want to be tricked into thinking that the wrong things matter because then you can put in all of this effort and it's still not going to give you the result you're looking for. So I'll just use an example, and this is kind of both inspired by the, the chalk awards that you just saw. So this spring, actually, um, we woke up one day in Fredericton and found hundreds of these, uh, these spray chalk signs around our city sidewalks. Um, and so there's a local economic development agency that's government funded that had done this. Um, and 
they were all done in different colors. The stencils are really nice, and they're all what, what I would call Fredericton facts. You know, one because they're about Fredericton, and two because many of them are only true in Fredericton. <laughs> I don't know how you measure the fourth most educated population in Canada, but I approach that with extreme skepticism. <laughs> um, so there were hundreds of these around, and and this is a great project. You know, it is a it was a really good thing for this agency to be doing. It's training them to be creative. Uh, people enjoyed seeing them. But the impact of it is not quite the same as another project, um, such as one that a young woman, a young dentist did in uh, another county after she saw my video. So right after she saw my video, she, she thought, well, you know what, I, I would really like to do that in my community. And she got some friends together, and in the middle of the night, she went out there and made her own stencils, and they, they pretty much just said, thank you, you're doing a really good job. And this is a, a poor county. Uh, it's um, a very, it's a fairly rural county. And there were people that were moving there and were trying to start businesses. And she went in there and said thank you. And she wrote notes, put them on the window of all these places. And the reaction to that was front page news. It's you know, I guess I were bandits in the night that did this. Someone is finally appreciating what I'm doing. It was such a nice pick me up. It was a great surprise. And when people realized it was Amanda that did this, this young dentist, she started becoming recognized as a leader in her community. Whereas before, she saw herself as a pre professional, for sure, and maybe a leader in her field, but not necessarily someone that her neighbors would turn to. But because they started doing that, she started taking on more responsibility. And I ended up meeting her in person, and she just ran up and gave me a hug at a conference for regional leaders. And she said, I'm here because I took that step to say thank you to my neighbors. And so that can cascade. And when you see the difference there, it's the same project. It's you know cheering your city on through its bridge home. It's a fun little project, anyone can do it. But the process is very different. The, in the uh, economic development agency sense, they had you know hired someone to do it, and it was very clean, it was very well done, perfectly executed, and it's a one-time thing. You'll walk around the city, you'll read it, and if nothing else really happens from it. In the other case, if you can even back this up to when I did this, it was makeshift. I had my parents out there with me, it was messy. Um, but they created the momentum for someone else to repeat it and for more to come from it. And so when we talk about wanting our places to have this power to, to continue to get better, eventually, you know, Midtown Inc and your government, eventually they're going to run out of energy to do that. We need to create the momentum that it can be self regenerated And that's where this comes from. The second reason it has to be you is because it builds capacity. These small acts, doing all this is actually a really important verb. To home butt is a verb. It is to make a place more inviting through do-it-yourself changes or installations. And it's in that verb that you get used to getting over the fear. It's in that verb that you learn to spot opportunities. It's in that verb that you make the friends and you make the connections to do bigger and better projects. And so as you see in the next presentations, you'll find small developers who've gone and really put a lot of money and make a physical change in their city. One that all of these people are, are benefiting from. And they're able to take that step because of the practice that starts in the very small letters, uh, uh, levels. So we learn to spot these opportunities, we learn to spot people that can help us. But more than anything, we break through the mountain of inaction. And whenever you have a good idea for something that should happen in your city, it looks a little bit like this, and this still happens to me. First, you have base camp, which is all the excuses on why you can't do it. And then you'll, uh, You'll get distracted for a while with all the other things that are on your plate. And then they're going to get really anxious. And what if they arrest me for doing this for a child? And you'll, you'll get all worried about the consequences of doing something good. And then finally, if you can get through all of that, it's going to get to the point where you need to find someone to do it with you. Because very rarely can you do this stuff alone. And so here's an example of how that actually plays out. Um, our farmer's market is open every Saturday. It's a fantastic part of our city. Uh, it's probably everybody's favorite tradition to go there. But remarkably, even though there's thousands of people there every week, they don't really have any seating. And so what people will do is they'll walk across the market and they'll sit on this lawn um, on the ground and, and eat their food from the food trucks. 
So I was there with my husband one day, he's my fiance at the time, and, um, and my young cousin, and we were looking, and my husband Ryan says, you know, we should really just put some chairs there. And I thought, yeah, we should do that. So we took the first step of saying yes. You know, you get lots of practice of just saying yes when you have a good idea. But then you go through the next steps. So, you know, here's, here's our excuse number one is, oh, well, we don't have the chairs to do this. We don't have the money to buy the chairs. We don't have a vehicle to put the chairs in, that sort of thing. And then, you, you know, for a couple of weeks, you think, oh, well, it's, you know, we just don't have time this weekend to do that. And you'll get distracted, and, and eventually you'll think, oh, well, I don't actually know who owns that property. What if it's illegal to put something there? And, you know, even though people have been sitting there all the time, no one gets them in trouble. I don't want to be the one that, that pushes the wrong button. But eventually, we got to the point of Catherine. And I had a, a potluck with some neighbors. We went over for dinner, and we started talking about the market, and everybody loves it. And we said, oh, you know, they really need some chairs. We were thinking the other day that we should go and just put out some chairs. And everybody started brainstorming, okay, well, how could we do this? We don't want to put some cheap plastic things out there that are just going to end up in a landfill. We don't want to end up spending tons of money on this. And someone thought of the idea, oh, well, what about stumps? Why don't we just put some wood stumps out there? And then the question becomes, how do you find the stumps? Since you're in a room of people, you've got your, your cats all herded. Apparently, you know, one of them has dealt with a tree service before, and they can say, oh, you can call this number. They cut down trees all the time. So we got to the point where I called the tree service and I said, hey, if you ever have a tree that you're cutting down, you call me back, thinking, this is my last excuse. This is my last way out. I've done everything I can. If the tree service doesn't call, it's not happening. And lo and behold, one morning they do. So I get out there, I skateboard over to the, the, the tree with my young cousin. We call up my friend with a pickup truck. And all of a sudden, we have 20 stops. And at this point, there's no turning back. You bring a neighbor involved, and uh, we painted the stumps together. We had everybody come out on a Friday night to put these stumps out at the market in time for the Saturday. And what happened here was that since everybody else had been involved in this, now they've helped climb their own mountain of an action too. I was leading the charge because I'm so used to getting over that. Um, and saying yes and following through with it. But I brought everybody else with me, and now they were so excited about this project that they're more willing to do other ones. And in fact, my friend with the pickup truck, we've been talking about something that we want to do next month. So he's all jazzed about this experience that he's had making a difference. And it went really well. You know, we, we did this chair long, that's what it's called, and we put all sorts of chairs in the area that needs chairs. We put the stumps out there, they look beautiful. And my favorite moment was seeing uh, a man with a cane, he must have been 75 years old. For the first time, he was able to go to the market and sit outside and wait for his wife. Because before, he had to sit in his car while she was at the market. Because he can't get up and down off the ground. You see pregnant women sitting on the, on the stumps, they can't get up and down off the ground. And of course, you see children having the time of their lives running around and jumping on these things. So it's all worth it. You have to climb them out to get there. But in the process, you build that capacity to do it again and to do it even better. So now I know the true service to call. <laughs> now I know the process to go through. And you build people you can count on. This is my downstairs neighbor, by the way. The final reason is that it has staying power. When I mentioned that you, know, you have a one-time project versus the momentum of doing something from the ground up, a DIY approach. It's because that DIY city building is going to deepen your affection for, for the people and the place that you're working in. Because it's hard. It's just, it's hard to do, and it's usually a little bit haphazard, so you end up having funny stories along the way. And so when you can look back on what you've done together, all of a sudden, everything is connected to the place in which you did that. We were just talking about, um, at our table up here, at an old shoe store that was on the street, and how it was kind of a wacky experience to go to this shoe store. But that's the memory that people hold on to, is, is the, the difficult um, sort of makeshift aspects of your city. And when you do that work with other people, of course, 
you're committed to them too. And if we need anything else in our city, if it's more caring for each other and caring for the actual place that we inhabit, whether that's you know the environment here or the uh, the buildings that represent our city. I love this quote from Wendell Berry. And it is in affection that we find the possibility of a neighborly, kind, and conserving economy. I really think that's the truth. Because it's difficult to maintain things. It's a lot of work that you have to put in just to make sure that nothing happens, right? <laughs> Anyone who's dealt with a house or even you know, fixing their clothes, maintaining is not a fun exercise. And we only are willing to do it when we love a place. Affection is the fuel of maintenance. You love the old buildings, and therefore you take care of them. You care, and so you do all the hard work that doesn't really have all that much payback. And I don't think that we can actually even build a place of enduring value without that. And you see that here. You know, you have a beautiful city, and I thank you so much for welcoming, welcoming me to it. When we walked around the neighborhood with Anne, you have these beautiful, beautiful buildings, and it's because people love them that they're willing to take care of them. There's not a lot of places in North America that have that same power of lovability. And so that's a huge, huge asset in your community. But of course you know this. Just like we all know that uh, good eating and exercise and lots of sleep keeps us healthy. It doesn't make it easier to do it. And still there are billion dollar industries convincing us that they're shortcuts. And still, we always fall from the shortcuts. It's the same way in city building. We know how to build a great city, but it's difficult. And so we're always looking for the answer. We're always looking for an arena to build, or a convention center, or something that's going to solve the problem for us. And I can't make that easier for you. All I can do is tell you that it's a great experience to try and do it the hard way. So I'm going to tell a couple short little stories about what happens when you're home buddy. And uh, I hope that this will inspire you to, to find something small in your life, the smallest thing possible that you can do, and you never know what's going to evolve from it. So I planted a front yard garden. I had a, an old tree that was in front of our apartment, and I think it came down in a storm or something. I was not happy about it. But after it went down, there was all these suckers that were coming out of the tree, and I started pruning them back into the life of the tree. So I'm working very hard to bring this tree tree back. And I thought I wanted to give it some friends. So I started planting perennials around the tree, and there's some seed in there. I've put all sorts of herbs that people can come pick. And last, uh, last fall, I put in garlic. And the garlic comes up, and of course, it's, it's very evident that it's not an ornamental plant. Um, and so it's, it's curious. People walk by, and they point, and they talk to us about it all the time. And in fact, I had a very warm experience one day when I was out there um, harvesting my first garlic. And we have a number of Syrian refugees that have moved to our community, and they're almost walking down our street. There's a, a community resource center at the end. So they were walking down with their child, and they don't speak English. But I pulled out the garlic, and they said, what's that? And I, I gave it to them to smell. And they said, oh, it's tomb. It's tomb. And we had a connected moment where they found a piece of their culture that was here as well they could recognize it every time they walked by. And I just gave it to them, so I hope that they made some garlic sauce with it. I learned that they live around the corner. So that's my, that's my little garden. But I wanted to make it even more special and a little bit more whimsy. I was inspired, actually, of walking through Jim's neighborhood in Minneapolis. There was all sorts of houses that had these fairy gardens out front. People were just kind of putting tiny little whimsical telephone booths and that sort of thing in front of their yard. I thought that is hilarious. The kids must love that. And I wanted to do something similar, but I'm not really a fairy girl. I am a pig girl. <laughs> I love pigs. I think they're so saucy and funny. Um, my mom grew up on a pig farm. And so I wanted to find the equivalent. I wanted to have like a crew of pigs. I wanted to have one with a chef hat and overalls. One with a construction suit, and that sort of thing. Had it looked like they were they were farming my little farm, my garlic farm out front. And I looked everywhere, everywhere for these things. I was looking on eBay, places where you would find figurines. I thought these were commonplace because my grandma, being a pig farmer, had all sorts of them. I could not find them. I did find something on Etsy though, and I went and I ordered them. And when 
when they arrived in the mail, they arrived in an envelope, and I thought, hmm, that, that's not right. <laughs> Seems a little bit like I've got the wrong order here. And I opened them up, and they were about a centimeter big. So I, yeah, about half an inch big, these pigs. So that was a little bit like, oh, okay, right, this is not going to work. But I put them out there anyways, thinking, okay, maybe it'll just be my little secret. I know that I've got them out there. And I placed them around, I put them out with little fences, and I'll rearrange them every once in a while because there's mama pigs and baby pigs. And another day when I was at gardening, the woman who lives three doors down, she walked and said, Chris, you have pigs. I was like, yes. <laughs> Your pigs are my daughter's favorite thing. Aww. Every single time we walk to the park, they make, make me walk by the workplace. And they're always petting them and checking in and seeing what's going on with the pigs. <laughs> and so what had happened is I had gone to Minneapolis. I had walked through someone's neighborhood. I had noticed that they had done something charming and cute for their kids. I had moved back to Fredericton. I had identified I want to do something too. I had made it my own. I had put them out there. It didn't even go the way I wanted it to. And yet it has created a connection, a secret connection that I have between myself and two little girls that live three doors down that makes their day every single time they go down the street. It makes them love the place they live, and it makes me feel like it was worth doing. And those are the kind of things that happen. We don't even know the impact of what we do. And sometimes we get a little glimpse where someone will, will mirror it right back to you. And all of these things can be fun. They don't take a lot of money to do. They don't take a lot of time to do. But these are the things that actually make a place feel special. And so the moral of the story is to do something small. It's going to make your city better in all of the right ways. It's going to be great practice for bigger projects that you might want to do, things that you might not even realize you want to do then. I never thought I would be a developer, but now I'm starting to save up so I can buy a triplex because I want to have a physical, I want to have a bigger physical impact on my city. And finally, putting in the work and doing these messy projects with other people really gives you an appreciation for them and for the place that you live. And this is the only road to get there. There is, there's no low-carb diet that's going to get us to this place. It's got to be the hard way. It's got to be the messy way. If you want to have a place of enduring value that people love. And so clearly this is a room of people that put their money where their mouth is. People that are committed enough to come here this early in the morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> to come and experience this. And so whenever you can find ways to support people that are doing fun stuff like this, or to do so yourself, keep doing that. You are the people that are going to make your city the place that you dream it. Thank you very much.